what we have offered now our clients is an additional revenue stream without absorbing the liability of what's happening in those rooms that they're renting. They are strictly landlords. And now they're, they have a healthy additional revenue stream coming into their practice. Welcome to the Real Estate Mogul MD Podcast. Thanks for tuning in and taking control of your financial future. This is a show where we not only motivate and inspire, we give you actionable, real-world experience to help you live life by design. You'll hear journeys and stories from other physicians, investors, coaches, consultants, and entrepreneurs. And now, here's your host, Brett Riggins. You know, I've talked with a lot of physicians who either on a build-out of a leased space or new construction, kind of always hear, make sure that you have room for growth. And a lot of times we'll end up with these uh, extra exam rooms, unused, underutilized um, exam rooms. Well, this conversation today is very, very interesting. This is like not not necessarily the Uber uh, or the Airbnb, but connecting this link of shared space with something that you may have the opportunity to take advantage of. Today's guest is the co-founder of Cloud Med Spas. You want to check that out, cloudmedspas.com. Learn a little bit more about this. It's a conversation today. We're gonna, I'm gonna drill down on some questions. What does this mean? How does shared space work? How can I create additional income with the unused real estate, unused space? Even if I'm leasing, even if I'm uh, in a new construction, maybe planning to grow. This is a very interesting con- concept. This is the co-founder of Cloud Med Spies. Everybody, please welcome Shannon Seabrand to the show. All right, Shannon, welcome to the show. We did it. We finally made it. We were scheduled a couple <laughs> times, and here we are. Welcome, welcome. Thank you. Thanks, Brett. Happy to be here. Yeah, I'm excited about this. And um, from an outsider's perspective, Shannon, I'm not a physician. I do have the privilege, honor, um, blessing of working with a lot of physicians. And the, the ones that I have kind of uh, intrigued me lately are the ones that are re- uh, have these relationships with med spas. And I'm always curious, like how this works, um, what's the correlation between the two, but the ones, um, the, I guess the colleagues that I have, the, the relationships that I have, they seem to be doing very well in this, mm-hmm. in this uh, avenue. So I'm excited to learn a little bit more about this and your business and your experience. So let's just start by telling the listeners or giving the listeners an idea of who is Shannon and what are we going to be talking about today? Um, So my name is Shannon Sieberin. I live in Northern California. I've been working with Cloud Med Spas for four years now. Um, And, you know, I love being in this space. My dad was a physician. Um, He's retired now. So I do feel like at my core, I understand a lot of the clients that I'm speaking with, a lot of their pain points and struggles with especially private practice challenges. Um, And so, you know, it's important. I love finding solutions for problems. And in healthcare, a lot of solutions are typically laywayed, um, you know, from a HIPAA standpoint, there's a lot of legal issues where, you know, challenges we're constantly faced with. And I love being able to provide a solution for my clients that uh, really helps maintain autonomy for their practice and for them to get back to what they what they truly love doing, which is uh, treating their patients. And so I'm excited to tell you more about Cloud Med Spas and how we collaborate with our clients. I love it. And just for the outsider... Um, the mm-hmm. person that knows nothing about it. I've never been to a med spa. I've driven by them. They have cool names. Uh, what is a med spa? <laughs> so a med spa is mostly offering non-invasive medical aesthetic procedures. Non-invasive meaning we're not, you know, they're not cutting into skin. They're doing treatments um, like Botox, which is a brand name, but typically people understand Botox as a neurotoxin treatment that helps, you know, relax fine lines on your face, filler treatments that add um, more body to areas of your face um, and, and device treatments that, you know, help with reducing pigmentation issues, hair removal, things like that. So non-invasive medical aesthetic treatments, um, uh, you know, they really are uh, also the gateway to larger aesthetic treatments that a portion of the population also takes advantage of um, from a plastic surgery standpoint. But 
the major, there's a huge marketplace for non-invasive um, medical aesthetic treatments, primarily injectables. And how does this then relate or become an opportunity for physicians listening that, um, I guess, what are the, what are the, the key points that create the opportunities there? What's, what's the mm-hmm. tie-in? Mm-hmm. So just a quick background is we initially started as a company that was creating WeWork spaces for medical injector practitioners. So opportunities for them to access space and product to grow their business, control their business with little overhead. We absorbed a lot of practitioners at one location. And what we realized from that is that you do not need a large amount of real estate um, in the field of medical aesthetics to have a lot of people using your space because they are practicing not for eight hours a day, but they're practicing and injecting patients for a small amount of time, two hours, three hours a week. And so what we realized is that there is a lot of available healthcare wellness space out there that is being underutilized by a lot of private practices. So whether you're a dentist, a physician, an OBGYN, a podiatrist, a lot of our clients have invested in real estate that where their growth didn't necessarily match with. So when they got into private practice, they purchased into a footprint of an expectation that their practice would grow 5x. And not everyone necessarily grew in that direction. And so now they find them in sp- themselves in spaces that are highly underutilized and they have extra exam rooms or they might be in the OR a couple days a week where their space sits empty. And what we're bringing to our clients is an additional revenue stream for the largest asset that they've invested in, their real estate. So think of it like an Airbnb when you rent the apartment above your garage, it's sitting there. So might as well just start generating some money for yourself and rent out that apartment above your garage. It's the same with exam rooms. So our clients now are able to generate additional revenue by renting their underutilized exam rooms. It is their prerogative when they want these rooms to be available and how often And there is a huge marketplace of independent injectors looking to rent that space on an hourly basis. So what we have offered now our clients is an additional revenue stream without absorbing the liability of what's happening in those rooms that they're renting. They are strictly landlords. And now they have a healthy additional revenue stream coming into their practice by utilizing space that was previously underused or not being used at all. And they're subsidizing overhead costs that are constantly increasing for them for their practice. And they potentially could also have additional foot traffic and a potential additional patient client traffic for their practice from being able to rent their space to uh, injectors, private practice aesthetic pr- uh, practitioners who tend to be in the medical profession themselves. They tend to be RNs and NPs. So you're a, a like mind, you know, like minded um, uh, space. And um, I can see where you can absorb the uh, administrative side until they show up, like until the, mm-hmm. the you, you're leasing, subletting the space, leasing the space, mm-hmm. and they have a patient coming in. Um, once they put basically uh, grab their the door handle, that mm-hmm. then tell me a little bit about the interaction on the administrative side um, when from the, the owner of the space, arrive. yeah, because the renter. They, as soon as they touch that doorknob, I mean, you're face to face with them. So yeah. I'm assuming, uh, or don't let me assume, let me just put out this other stuff. You know how it works. If um, the person renting the space, do they have um, a receptionist or how does that work? Well, typically we like to say there should be someone at that space um, for that, land, we're calling them landlord client, yeah. who can help manage the utilization of the space. But the Software is doing all of that. The software is managing the practitioners who are scheduling time in the space, whether, you know, practitioner Jenny Smith is coming in Thursday from 12 to 2 and treating four patients. She is booking that time in the software. So if there is a receptionist at that location, she can see. No one's surprised when practitioners show up. She can see, oh, Jenny's coming in today. She's going to be in exam room C. I assume she's injecting patients, but there is no crossover of patient knowledge. There is no patient transaction absorbed by the location owner. So that's why this is completely HIPAA compliant. The entire experience is managed by the renter 
the aesthetic practitioner. It's completely independent um, management of their own business. And so the software, our software is what is doing all the work. Um, an easy comparison of software is think of open table for restaurants, right? It is not the brand of the restaurant, but it is a software platform that is helping that restaurant run as efficiently as possible to seat as many people during the dinner hour as possible as, as many tables are available. So that software is doing all of that booking and managing the flow and efficiency of that restaurant. That is what Cloud Med Spa software is doing. So if there are two exam rooms available at Dr. Smith's office, he could potentially have 25, 30 different practitioners renting in those two exam rooms because they're all going to be seeing patients at different times, different days of the week. And so you really diversify the access and who's in the space and you increase the opportunity for you to also uh, make more revenue by having a more diverse um, an increased opportunity for renters. Very interesting. Um, and I do see that on your website, it's cloudmedspas.com, C-L-O-U-D-M-E-D-S-P-A-S. Yes, it's com. plural. Yes. Yeah, cloud, cloudmedspas.com. Um, I see that Cloud Med Spa software on there. Is that mm -hmm. something um, then that the, because in, in, I'm, I'm looking at it from the business perspective too. Yep from your perspective, I mean, you've got client acquisition and you've got space acquisition. You know, you've got two sides of the client acquisition there. Mm -hmm. Does this um, software then act as booking or how does that connect with it these does. independent injectors? So the independent injectors are accessing the space and the uh, scheduling opportunity and the access to the product they need to treat their patients through the app. So the renters are downloading the app they can select which location they want to rent at. Um, they select the day, the time. They purchase the neurotoxin or the filler they need to treat their patient for that day. The client who owns, who is the purchaser of our software and the location owner sees on their end, in their administrative side of the software, their booking platform. And they can see who's booked when for every day of that month right? And the time they're going to be in the space. And that owner of the software can also control when space is available, when, you know, day, time, any of that. So they're in control of when their space is accessible. And they're always aware of who's in their space. What the app also controls is the, the requirements to be an independent practitioner. Most states require independent injector practitioners to have their own medical director oversight their own malpractice. And so the app also takes care of that process. So when a practitioner downloads the app, they are required to upload proof of medical directorship, proof of malpractice. This again is putting the practitioner in the driver's seat. They are liable for their own business, their own practice, their ability to practice, all of their oversight. And the app obviously makes sure that those requirements are fulfilled before they start renting space at our client's location. Then you probably have, I can't imagine uh, the uh, legal work that you've gone through to get to this point, but the indemnifications then as as a landlord, mm -hmm. um, then, you know, being released from any, mm -hmm. from any uh, liability. Correct. Yep. That's all in our terms and conditions in the app that practitioners have to agree to in order to start utilizing that space. Mm -hmm. Obviously, and it is the prerogative of the location owner. If after a space rental or two, they realize, you know what, I don't want this practitioner in my space for one reason or another, we haven't seen it happen. It is your prerogative to end their access to your space. So again, you're not letting any, you know, access to any Tom, Dick or Harry. These are people who have the proper legal requirements, which then obviously um, alleviates you as a location owner from um, any legal uh, liability. At any certain point, so I'm. I hope this is not offensive. I'm seeing this as kind of like the um, Uber of cloud med. Uh, of You're exactly. It's exactly right? what it is. Yep. Very interesting. So, it's not offensive. Yeah. <laughs> no, it's not offensive at all. We're constantly comparing ourselves. What we always say is we didn't re we didn't invent shared space. Shared space has been around for a while now. Yeah. But what we are is we're providing an opportunity for people in the healthcare wellness 
space to obviously take advantage of shared space opportunities as well. We haven't seen any tools or resources um, in place to really support that. And so we're bringing to the table a way to leverage shared space and to generate revenue from that. And um, and as far as the Uber concept, what we've realized is people want to control their schedules. They want to control their profitability. They want to decide when they work, you know, and, and, and that is what we're also offering this marketplace of injectors who want to control their schedule and their profitability because they realize the patient relationship is under their control. You know, they they could be employed by said plastic surgeon, but when they leave the plastic surgeon, most likely those injector patients will follow them. Mm -hmm. So let's empower them, obviously, to uh, have all the tools to run their own business and manage their clientele. So your platform then um, is probably a lot of now you've got three. You've got uh, landlords, you've got. Mm -hmm. Um, injectors, injectors, and then you've got injectees, right? So, you, mm -hmm. so you're going after all three of them. And then when the when the actual patient is on on the app, is there what do you guys do for? I mean, some people like to call, right? Some people like to yeah. talk to people. So how does that work on the app? So the patient is not on the app, um, at least not yet. So mm -hmm. we are in, we are creating a capability for injectors who are on the app scheduling space at our locations to also complete their transactions with their patients on the app and do scheduling on the app. But right now, our injectors and practitioners who work at all of our locations, and I wouldn't say ours, but the injectors, the practitioners that work at these locations have their own scheduling platforms. They have their own EMR platform. So they are managing that relationship. Are they connected separate. or do they have to? So the, the injectors- Right now, they're not connected. Oh, wow. That's a big step. Is that yeah. And so to we're connecting those. So okay. we are in the process of connecting those. Um, it hasn't been a problem, though. What we realize is practitioners have their own scheduling. On Sunday nights, they may sit down with our app and schedule other patients for that week. Yeah. Because they, they know in advance who's coming in that week. So they'll sit down on the app and schedule the patients because what they realize is getting access to time and space is not an issue mm -hmm. um, with booking last minute. Um, with our location. So that's typically how they've been doing it. Obviously, we do ideally want them synced and for practitioners to have the option to schedule patients and schedule uh, time at the location at the same time. And we'll be coming out with that capability soon, very soon. Very, very interesting. And has yeah. it been more difficult with integrating with the different EMRs or going no. to the legal side of like HIPAA stuff? Yeah, the EMR, keeping that separate is not a problem. Um, obviously, the practitioners who have medical directors oversight, a lot of those medical directors want access to the EMR as well. And so that's a completely separate tool. And that helps maintain the HIPAA compliance as well okay. with our landlord clients. Interesting. Yeah. Um, and, and then in no situation, do you actually need someone speaking on the phone? Is that correct? Nope. I I struggle with that because sometimes I just want to talk to somebody. Maybe it's my generation or, you know, my personality or what it is, but sometimes I just well, want to talk to somebody, you know? Well, we are always available for our clients, right? The people who own the space and who own the software, we have, you know, weekly to monthly statuses with all of our clients to make sure the software is working well, that they are onboarding practitioner renters at their location, and that is going smoothly. Um, for the practitioners at the location, what they end up cultivating their own network amongst each other, which is great. Mm -hmm. So we are also available for them to call us to ask us questions, but they typically go to the location owner when seeking resources and support that we support our clients with. Um, and they end up cultivating their own network. So when you think of if you go to WeWork and you want to meet someone else who's in the same tech space as you, you can do that. You can find and have those sort of um, brainstorming opportunities. We have the same environments at our Cloud Med Spa networks, and we realize the nurses who end up injecting and practicing at those locations do build their own networks. And it's healthy, it's not competitive because they all have their own client base. And that is a very healthy network to have to continue to grow your education and training, which is a very important aspect of this career in this market. Um, and, you know, 
that is, it's it's an important community to have as opposed to renting a space alone and injecting alone somewhere. It's very important to be able to have that networking community. And where in the world do you um, figure market rent for this? I, I, like, tell me a little bit about that, because you probably negotiate uh, on both ends, right? So I primarily work with clients who are seeking us out for our software and um, for leveraging their underutilized space. So I'm I'm dealing with a lot of different clients who are trying, who are, I would say 50% of them are familiar with aesthetics and 50% of them are, are like you. That's like, I, I don't know what, you know, who an injector is and what they do. Mm -hmm. And so there is a little bit more education as to who the renter is with those clients, but that does not dissuade the opportunity, right? Because the opportunity at the end of the day is leveraging space. And so that is a very attractive opportunity and it's not um, discriminatory of any potential client of ours, right? If a podiatrist wants to rent space to someone who's injecting Botox, it's, it's about the space and it's about the access to the product in the space and the competitive pricing. So, um, you know, I, we've obviously we've learned there's a huge marketplace of nurses, mostly nurses, RNs and NPs who are trying to get into the medical aesthetic space and become injectors. Um, the nursing industry is, we know is, is struggling because the demand of the job and of the profession is, is getting harder and harder, long work weeks, um, a lot of hours and nurses, this is an endemic space for them to make sort of a um, a horizontal pivot and move and to start accessing a career in a space they can control their schedule, they can control their profit profitability and dial back from a 70 hour work week in a hospital and maybe do a 20 hour work week in a hospital and make an additional $5,000 a month cash injecting on the side. So we feel like we're doing a lot for the female um, nurse out there and allowing her to have more flexibility, more control, more profit in her career as well. How do you how do you directly figure the market value of, of the space? Because I, I mean, I can look at an annual cost per square foot, you know, mm -hmm. typically plus tie cam, that kind of stuff. But how do you break that down if you're rent if you're leasing the space? If you're renting hour, yeah. Like tell me, yeah. tell, tell us a little bit about that. Well, what we've realized, as I've said, the, the majority of the marketplace are practitioners that are trying to enter the space. So very few practitioners want to come into a space and sign a monthly lease for $1,000 when mm -hmm. they have yet to create their client list, yeah. <laughs> right? So how do we reduce that overhead risk? Well, we, we charge them for the space when they're only generating revenue. And that's how we get them in. If you're charging $500 for a Botox treatment and we're charging you $99 for the room and you're paying, let's say, $200 for the product for that procedure, you're taking home $200 on one procedure. And from the practitioner standpoint, that's a great margin. So what if I did two of those procedures in an hour, which is easy, right? I'm not paying for the room a second time. And what we have realized based on our own brick and mortar locations is that practitioners in the space are not necessarily working a 40 hour work week when leveraged with the opportunity to control their own scheduling. Mm -hmm. They're working five or eight hours a week. So they would prefer to pay by the hour. Mm -hmm. So they can go to Cape Cod for a month in July and not pay for a lease. Yep. So again, the overall resounding benefit of, for both our clients and the marketplace of practitioners is reducing overhead risk. How do we continue to reduce the cost of entry? If you wanted to open your own med spa, you take a million, half a million dollar loan, right? To start that space, hire the injectors, get a marketing plan in place to get clients in the door, buy the devices, all of that, buy the product. It's a very expensive and risky venture. So we're saying, let's remove all of those aspects. Let's give control to the practitioner. You guys have the space to provide. We will support with the product. Everyone gets what they need and no one's at risk. Interesting. Uh, it's almost, I went from Uber to Airbnb in that that last train of uh, conversation there. So interesting mm -hmm. by the hour. And I'm also hearing or feeling or sensing, um, you know, speaking with physicians who uh, want to maybe leave the hospital or want to break out and do their own practice. I hear a lot that they 
you know, would look and find rooms to rent of these places. Mm -hmm. I'm, I'm thinking like it, it could almost be um, outside of uh, MedSpot too. I don't know if you guys have come across that idea yet where you're renting the space to other physicians as well too. Yeah, it depends on the specialty, right? Because a lot of uh, medical specialties still, um, you know, if they're still absorbing insurance, there's a lot of paperwork and requirements mm. and staff required to fulfill all of that. Mm -hmm. um, we feel like this net model really works for the cash business medical yeah. profession, right? Yeah. So when you're bypassing insurance uh, and bypassing a lot of risk on the procedures you're offering. Mm -hmm. yeah. um, so from that standpoint, you know, it's very clean for us to stick to medical aesthetics. It's a market that's growing year upon year. It's growing from the amount of practitioners entering the space and it's growing from the demand of people uh, wanting the procedures. It used to be 40 and 50 year old housewives and now it's 20 year old women and now it's men getting the procedures, right? Mm. So the demand for the procedures is growing. We need more practitioners offering the procedures. And so that's really the marketplace that we're feeding into. Interesting. Um, things go well and things go bad. What I love sharing with everybody <laughs> is the ups and the downs of the both sides. It's not all sunshine and rainbows. It's not going to be perfect. <laughs> putting this stuff together. So I don't want to air the dirty laundry, but I just want to talk about some of the, like maybe one of the the, the cool things that's happened um, and what you learned from it. And then also what was one of the worst things that's happened? And then as a group, as a collective, what did you learn from that as well too? So I would say one of the, you know, best things that's happened is what we've seen a lot in the medical spaces, um, you know, the pr private equity uh, interest in buying up private practices because physicians leave medical school, they get, they're already in debt, but they get further into debt because their goal is to own a private practice. Um, <clears throat> and a lot of them struggle with the overhead and costs of, we're all dealing with insurance companies managing their margins, um, salary expenses. And what I what I love that we're doing is that we are providing an opportunity for physicians, people in that private practice space, dentists, orthodontists, physicians to maintain that autonomy without thinking my only option is to buy into a group or to sell out to a larger company because the business of medicine is too much for me. Unfortunately, a lot of these physicians aren't going to medical school to learn how to run a business. And that mm -hmm. is in theory what they end up doing. So I love providing a solution that continues to give them that control and autonomy in what they love to do and their passion for their specialty and to provide them a revenue stream that alleviates a lot of that pressure and stress and overhead of overhead costs that they have. Mm -hmm. I would say some of our biggest challenges because of the marketplace of practitioners there's this huge demand of obviously nurses in the marketplace who are entering aesthetics. Um, and I would say one of the hardest things is convincing someone that the opportunity to be an entrepreneur in the space, financially, they know it's better for them, but that they're capable of being an entrepreneur because that is a mindset not everybody has. And that's a very confident mindset. And a lot of people get into nursing um, because they're in the field, they, you know, obviously the majority of them get into nursing because they want to care for people and obviously, and that's at the heart of what they do, but they're also in roles where they know X, Y, Z is what they're supposed to do. So for them to pivot and control their destiny and create their own initiatives and drive their own ship is a mindset that is not an endemic to a lot of nurses, but they're capable of it. And so I think what we didn't realize when we were on for our own brick and mortars, the side of um, convincing potential aesthetic practitioners that this opportunity of entrepreneurship is, is the best route for them. Um, that would be, you know, such a challenging feat um, to obviously deal with that confidence aspect of, of the practitioner. Um, but we've seen, we've seen so many success stories of, of practitioners starting out that it keeps us going. So I think what we've learned from this too, is that you can't obviously create something of somebody who doesn't already see it in themselves, but it keeps us going because for every 10th practitioner we convince and who sets off on their own and is very good at this and 
and understands their potential is is limitless that is successful um that for us is as rewarding as you know the the prospects who don't necessarily pan out in this space in this field um as practitioners so i feel like we're creating more entrepreneurs in a space and empowerment in a space where um, they're very deserving. When doesn't it work for a landlord? When is a landlord not a good fit? I think for the landlords that assume um, they don't have to put any effort into an opportunity, as we always say, every good opportunity comes with a little effort. If um, for those of us who think there's get rich quick schemes overnight that exist, it, we all know that doesn't. <laughs> Mm -hmm. don't exist. Otherwise, we'd all be millionaires. So every great opportunity comes with an equal amount of effort, right? So for our clients who take on our software and understand the effort to put into place of getting um, practitioners on board and getting the ball rolling um, at their location, it really takes off for them. For those that think, you know, it would, if you build it and they will come, that's not the case, right? Um, and we collaborate very closely with our clients on the proper acquisition opportunities and getting people to their door and how to close potential renters and how to make that happen. And once you have the foundation of a couple practitioners in place, the work happens for you. The acquisition happens for you. So the because landlord, the landlord has to source and close practitioners then. We help source them. They have to close. Right. I'm in Northern California for a client who's in Miami, Florida, that practitioner comes to their location. They have to be able to explain the concept and close at their location and get that practitioner on board as a renter. And we support with that whole process. But at the end of the day, it's a you know, it's something that has to be done personally. Interesting. And now on um, Airbnb as a owner of a property, I get to leave a review for a guest. As a guest, mm -hmm. they get to leave a review for the property. Is that built into your app as well too, where the practitioner and the landlord can leave a review? It is not. Um, we have testimonials on our website of practitioner experiences. Um, yeah, but I'm, but just thinking, I'm just thinking like on the Airbnb side, there's so much of it you know, matters. And if I'm a prac, well, I guess if, if you're sourcing the practitioner for the landlord, then it would be helpful to see what other people like if they're mm -hmm. practicing, but it's probably not like Airbnb. I'm probably over. It's a little like, different. It's a Airbnb is a little bit more B to C than B to B is right, I think right. what we are. Yeah. yeah. Um, and obviously each practitioner in the space has their own website. They have their own business name. They have their own client reviews as an aesthetic injector. Mm -hmm. What we tend to do is if someone's coming to that practice and seeking the opportunity as a renter, we connect them with the existing renters, right? Like talk to Julie. She's been renting here for six months. She's Her business is doing well. We, we want full transparency. We want other practitioners to connect at location. So we keep those lines of communication open and we're constantly feeding into them. And as a landlord in this agreement that that is entered into with a practitioner, can, I mean, is that on a day by day basis or is it 30 day notice like what what's that it's you know obviously they when the practitioners come bar, on board at a location they're paying a monthly membership is what we encourage our our uh, landlord clients to have and so think of it like a gym membership when you join a gym you're paying $99 a month obviously it incentivizes you to go and use that space. But if you go a month without going to the gym, you're not necessarily going to cancel your membership. So we encourage our owners to have that membership in place. And, you know, clearly at the end of the day, you can pull out of your gym membership. You can cancel your payment at any time. You know, that is in theory how this works as well. Nobody is, we're, we're sort of anti-contract. Nobody is bound to have to use a space or stay in a space, but we don't see people leaving, right? When they come on board and they're renting and their overhead is minimal, they see the benefit of growing their client base and continuing to generate a lot of revenue for themselves. That's amazing. And all of this can be found at cloudmedspas.com. Really cool website. Learn a lot. Like you said, there's testimonials on there, more information about the process, the system, and a way to connect with you guys, right? Yep. Yes, please. So don't hesitate to reach out. And my phone number is 
398-1999 if you want to text me. Would love to have the um, the introduction and the conversation. That's wonderful. That's wonderful. Well, thank you so much for your time, Shannon. I really appreciate it. Thank you, Brett. How was the conversation? Huh? How are the questions? They were great. They were yeah, awesome. Fun. Yeah, fun. fantastic. I hopefully, hopefully this, you know, is comprehensive for your listeners. And if and if anything, you know, we love having the personal conversation of how this could potentially fit for their location. Yeah. Yeah. I just think that there's so there's so much opportunity here. Great idea. Great platform. Thank you for your time, Shannon. You, um, Thank you. very well. And it made it very clear. So hopefully the listeners kind of grasp in the same time I was. Wonderful. Awesome. Right. I hope so. so much. Thank you. Thank you to the listeners out there today. Uh, if you have any questions, um, feel free to either email us at info at physicianwellsystems.com. Check out the website to um, connect with Shannon. It's cloudmedspas.com. And I think even if you're considering this, if you have that, if you have one open room, if you have this idea, if this kind of sparked just uh, any bit of interest, reach out to them and see if this could be a great way to diversify the opportunities that you have currently. Uh, thanks again for your time. More importantly, for your attention. Uh, hopefully, if you, whether you're in the hospital, um, in the office building, in the car, in a in the gym, hopefully you're not spending 30 days without being in the gym because that's so important. But no matter where you're <laughs> at, we appreciate your attention. Until this next time, this is the Real Estate Mogul MD.